And good morning, everyone. Happy Tuesday morning to you. Welcome back to Morning Musings. My name is Don K. Preston. I am the president of Preterist Research Institute, Lord Moore, Oklahoma. Hope you had a fantastic weekend uh, celebrating Memorial Day, the tremendous sacrifice that our military uh, people uh, have and do uh, experience in order to keep America safe. And, uh, you know, the dedication of our military people really is to be admired. And I'm not going to talk about the politics of American foreign policies, okay? No question whatsoever that American foreign, pol foreign policy has at times been atrocious. Uh, it, it has been detrimental to world peace, et cetera, et cetera. But American military individuals uh, have been and continue to be willing to lay their lives on the line uh, to serve in what they perceive to be an honorable way. And they are doing that to protect American lives, uh, American interest, American families. So for that, we are extremely, extremely thankful. Now, like I said, no, no sense a bunch of you piling on me and saying, well, America blew this and America did that wrong, blah, blah, blah. Believe me, I know, I know an awful lot of American foreign policy decisions have been absolutely atrocious, and I'm not defending those. In spite of all that, guess what? America is still the greatest nation on the face of the earth. We, have, we do more good work, we do more merciful work, benevolent work, than any other nation on the face of the earth. That is to be commended. So I'll get off my soapbox. I just wanted to say, hope you had a fantastic weekend. Hope you were safe. Hope you uh, were able to enjoy your family. Okay, now then, uh, we have been examining Matthew chapter 25, 31 and following, and how this fantastic pericope, this parable, <clears throat> must be viewed through the prism of the rest of Jesus' parables, how it must be viewed within the, uh, the framework of Old Testament prophecies, and how beautifully, how wonderfully it corresponds with Daniel 12, Matthew 13, Matthew 24, and Revelation chapter 11. Now, I hope you'll go back. I hope you will watch last Thursday's video, which was in some ways, not totally at all, but in some ways, it was a compilation of many of the foregoing videos that I have done on Matthew chapter 25, 31, and following. I sincerely believe that if you will go there, if you will follow the steps point by point by point, that you will see how incontrovertible the evidence is. <coughs> Pardon me. <clears throat> pardon me, <clears throat> for the fulfillment of Matthew chapter 25, 31, and following in AD 70. Uh, I really, I think if you'll just look at that video, take your time, analyze each point, examine each point made carefully, analytically, based upon the evidence that I present, and again, I believe the conclusion is absolutely incontrovertible. Now, I want to, as it were, take a step backwards. I suggested that I was going to do this some weeks ago, but I want to show that Matthew chapter 25, 31 and following is in fact based upon drawing from Joel chapters 2 and 3. This is really, really important. It is important because it demonstrates a variety of things, chief among them, and that is the temporal as well as the covenantal context and framework for the fulfillment of Matthew chapter 25, 31, and following. <clears throat> now, what do we find in Joel chapter 2? Well, in Joel 2, 28 and following, we have the great prophecy of the last days. Now, I have to tell you, I was raised in the all-millennial world of the churches of Christ. I was raised believing that the last days began on Pentecost. Because after all, P 
Peter quoted from Joel chapter 2, 28 and following, and said, this is that. So that must mean, we are told, the last day started on Pentecost. Well, look, nothing could be farther from the truth. And in my book, The Last Days Identified, I have an extensive discussion demonstrating why the last days did not begin on Pentecost. Pentecost was part of the last days that had already begun with the ministry of John the Baptizer. And that's such a critical point to understand. So, it shall come to pass in the last days, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old man shall dream dreams. I will show wonders in heaven above, signs in earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke before the coming of the great and the terrible day of the Lord. Now we have here a panoramic, a panoramic overview of the last days. The last days, including the outpouring of the Holy Spirit as a sign of the coming of the great and the terrible day of the Lord. Now look, folks, the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord is the day of Matthew chapter 25, 31 and following. It's the time of the gathering of the nations. Now, Joel 2 continues, <clears throat> telling us, and it shall come to pass, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Redemption would be placed in Zion. <laughs> Boy, how incredibly significant is that. Now, here's the day of the Lord. Here's salvation for all who call on the name of the Lord, and salvation is placed in Zion. Guess what Hebrews chapter 12, 21 and following says? You have come to Mount Zion. I, I want to tell you, I really honestly believe that Hebrews chapter 12, 21 and following is one of the most eschatologically significant passages that is sometimes overlooked. In Old Testament prophecy after Old Testament prophecy, we are told of the significance of, quote, Zion, the last days, the messianic Zion. And in the last days, the nations would flow to Zion. I should say, the mount of the Lord's house, the messianic kingdom would be established, and as a result of the establishment of the kingdom, then nations would flow into it. Zion is where salvation would be, would be placed, Isaiah 46, verse 13. Zion is where the resurrection life would be found, Isaiah 25, 1 to 10. On and on and on it goes. Zion is the focus of messianic salvation. It's just incredible how important Zion is in Old Testament prophecies. Zion would be the locus of the restoration of all 12 tribes of Israel and in addition to that, the flowing of the nations, i.e. the Gentiles, into Israel's salvation. So again, when the writer of Hebrews says, you have come to Mount Zion, what does that mean, ladies and gentlemen? It means that the prophetic consummation was occurring in the first century. That means that the last days we're about to be consummated because you see the last days would run until the day of the Lord. <clears throat> the day of the Lord would result in salvation in Zion, to put it like that. Okay, so we have Joel chapter 2, 28 to 32, promising the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the last days as a sign of the coming of the great and the terrible day of the Lord. Now, chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. 
I hope you understand that chapter divisions are not part of the ancient biblical text. There are no chapter divisions at all. But Joel chapter 3, verse 1 and 2 says, And it shall come to pass in those days. In what days? The last days. Now watch. And at that time. At what time? The great and the terrible day of the Lord. I will gather all nations to judgment. In the last days, at the great and terrible day of the Lord, the Lord would gather all nations. What's Matthew chapter 25, 31 and following? Do you know of anybody that disagrees that it's set in the last days, that it's the climax and consummation of the last days? I don't know of anyone who teaches that. So here in Matthew chapter 25, 31 and following, at the climax and consummation of the last days, what do we have? The gathering of all nations to judgment. That means that Matthew chapter 25, 31 and following is about the fulfillment of Joel 2 and 3. So what I'm going to do tomorrow is to look at the constituent elements of Joel 2 and 3 a little bit closer. <clears throat> I've touched on them a little bit here. I'm going to look, <clears throat> pardon me, look at them a little bit closer and then correlate them with the Olivet Discourse and Matthew chapter 25, 31 following, showing, oh, and by the way, Acts 2 and following, to show it was fulfilled in the first century, proving the Olivet Discourse is not divided. It's not about two subjects, i.e., the fall of Jerusalem in AD 70, and then the end of time. Oh, no. The climax of Israel's last days in the great and terrible day of the Lord that occurred in AD 70. Well, thanks for joining me for this morning's morning musings. I'll see you on the flip side.